so um one minute past four o'clock and we say then good afternoon and most welcome to the third one event webinar um we have a beautiful september day here in sweden at least where i am um the sun is shining and we have blue skies um, my name is Maria Shipos and I am the commercial product manager here at Monivent, together with my colleague, uh, Maria Lindquist, uh, one of the co-founders of Monivent. We will be your hosts today. So um, during this hour, um, we have scheduled um, two presenters. So we have two presentations related to tactile stimulation and its effects on breeding. Following the two presentations, we will have a questions and answer session. And we encourage our participants to uh, post uh, questions in the, in the chat. And we will ask them uh, after the presentations. So, Today, we are very happy to introduce our two invited speakers, both from Leiden Medical uh, University Medical Center in the Netherlands. We have Assistant Professor Janneke Decker and Medical Engineer Sophie Kramer with us. So I will start with introducing Janneke as our first speaker. Assistant Professor Janneke Decker is clinical researcher who is enthusiastic about translating clinical observations into research in order to increase the understanding about the physio physiological mechanism. Janneke started her PhD curriculum in 2014 on the supervision of Professor Ariane Tepas. And um, it, from uh, Leiden University Medical Center, the Netherlands, and Professor Stuart Hooper, Monash University, Melbourne in Australia. While she started her PhD curriculum part-time next to her work as a NICU nurse at the Leiden University Medical Center, she dedicated her time fully to research in her final year. Her research focuses on improving oxygenation of infants in the perinatal period, Dr. Decker is the principal investigator of the NeoStim trial, the largest clinical trial performed in the delivery room so far. She's also the chair of the neonatal resuscitation section of the ESPR, where she aims to promote collaboration on delivery room research to reduce gaps in scientific knowledge. The title of Dr. Decker's presentation is Tactile stimulation at birth, outdated or essential. And with that, I present. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Janneke Decker and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Leiden University Medical Center. My research focuses mainly on uh, stimulation of spontaneous breathing and tactile stimulation is an intervention we can use to promote spontaneous breathing. So I will talk a bit about that today and tell you whether it is outdated or essential uh, at birth. So infants used to be intubated and mechanically ventilated at birth, but this practice changed after the results of some large clinical trials were published. And in these trials, elective intubation and mechanical ventilation was compared to early initial CPAP to assess the effect on the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia in extremely preterm infants. And the results of these trials were consistent, but they also showed a non-significant reduction in the rate of death or BPD at 36 weeks postnatal age. So when these trials were then pulled in a systematic review, this resulted in a small but significant reduction in the risk for death or BPD in the CPAP treated infants. And the number needed to treat was between 20 and 25 infants. And since the publication of these results, more research has been performed to optimize the use of nasal CPAP or non-invasive ventilation at birth. And this has been implemented broadly. 
and therefore it has also been recommended now in, as the preferred method of support in the current version of the resuscitation guidelines of the European Resuscitation Council. They now state that for spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress who require respiratory support in the delivery room, it is suggested that CPAP should be used initially rather than intubation and IPPV. And I think the most important part of this sentence is that it is for spontaneously breathing preterm infants, because this te technique of non-invasive ventilation will not be effective if infants are not breathing. And I will explain to you on the next slide. So in order to provide non-invasive ventilation effectively, you will need an open airway that also includes the larynx. And it has been shown that directly at birth, the larynx of a preterm infant is predominantly closed when the infant is apneic, and it will only remain open once a stable breathing pattern has been achieved. However, if you provide non-invasive respiratory support in infants that don't have a stable respiratory drive yet, um, your non-invasive ventilation will not be active because it can't reach the lung. And these infants are then at risk of prolonged hypoxia, which again suppresses breathing. So it is very important for preterm infants to stimulate spontaneous breathing in order to make your non-invasive ventilation effective. And one of the interventions that can be used to stimulate spontaneous breathing is the use of tactile stimulation. In utero, the fetus shows breathing movements that are not aimed for gas exchange because that occurs across the placenta. But during these fetal breathing movements, small volumes of lung liquid move in and out of the airways and thereby promote lung expansion and lung growth. And the patterns of fetal breathing movements change with the arousal state of the fetus. For example, during the sleep state with rapid eye movements, the breathing movements are um, not very uh, deep, but rhythmic. And in the non-REM sleep state, the, the breathing movements are more, uh, have a higher effort, but are more discontinuous. And after birth, the purpose of breathing movement changes to establish lung aeration and, and gas exchange. But the trigger from changing from a discontinuous breathing pattern before birth to a more continuous breathing pattern after birth uh, are not completely known yet, but they could include a change in arousal state like it did in utero. And the arousal state of the preterm infant is um, influenced directly when the infant's born because it then experiences light, cold and sound. And you could also add to that tactile simulation, which is probably the most basic and intrinsic intervention that we use in the delivery room. Until recently, only a few experimental studies looked at the effect of tactile simulation on breathing effort. Um, for example, Faraday showed that rats perform a whole process of tactile stimulation at birth, which consists of cleaning of the airways by suctioning of the nose and mouth which you can see on the left in the left picture. And if necessary, they push the chest with a paw, which you can see on the right. They lick the spine and they bite the tail. And if the pups were removed from their mother before the mother could perform this whole process, the, the rats developed respiratory distress and died. And also other studies emphasize the importance of stimulation. And it is shown that breathing effort was higher in preterm rats that were stimulated compared to rats that didn't receive any stimulation. So it would thus seem logical to use this technique to stimulate breathing of preterm infants at birth too. However, while the current resuscitation guidelines recommend to use this intervention, they are not very clear on how this should be performed in clinical practice. None of the guidelines uh, specify timing or methods of stimulation and the European Resuscitation Council just says that you should try the baby and that it will usually produce enough stimulation to induce effective breathing. However, we currently are not drying very preterm infants but place them in a polyethylene bag. So then you would lose your tactile stimulation in these infants. And the American Heart Association simply states that you should stimulate the infant to breathe. 
And this could probably be a reason why recent studies of stimulation practice in human, human newborn resuscitation show a wide variety in practice. And luckily we don't see those brutal and astonishing uh, methods anymore, unless you would like to have the baby to have an IVH or something. But we could still use some guidance on how to perform stimulation. So uh, we performed a systematic review recently, with, and we have published that about the use of tactile stimulation in the delivery room. And this review included various observational studies in which the rate of tactile stimulation was shown. And as you can see, the rate of tactile stimulation was much lower in studies that include preterm infants compared to term infants. In addition, the timing, uh, location, um, the frequency and the duration varied widely between the studies. But most importantly, the lowest rates of of stimulation were reported in infants below 30 weeks of gestation. And those infants are wrapped in a polyethylene bag for thermoregulation, which could probably form like a physical barrier and thereby contribute to the omission of stimulation. However, these are also the infants that usually need the most respiratory support and could therefore benefit most from receiving tactile stimulation. And while these observational studies were unable to identify how effective tactile stimulation was in terms of respiratory effort, but the effect of oxygenation was examined in two of these studies. And after tactile stimulation was performed in the study of Vincent Gardner and Nadia Bajsnedic, the oxygen saturation increased with 1 and 9%. And the true effect of tactile stimulation is very difficult to determine in human preterm infants. And although the recent observational studies describe that tactile stimulation is often omitted, there's no clinical equipoise to randomize infants not to reef tactile stimulation, since it has been recommended for since living memory. And therefore, the effect of stimulation at discretion of the caregiver was compared to standard stimulation. Um, that was considered standard stimulation, and it was compared to a strict protocol of repetitive stimulation in a randomized controlled trial. And we included 44 infants in that trial, and we hypothesized that repetitive stimulation um, consisting of stimulation episodes of 10 seconds alternated with 10 second pauses could improve breathing effort. And we included pauses in stimulation in an attempt to avoid habituation of the effect of, of the reflex. And breathing effort in this trial was shown to be higher in the re repetitive stimulation group, although uh, these differences did not re reach statistical significance. And this could be due to the design of the study. Because we aim to compare repetitive stimulation to a group where only a small proportion of babies would be stimulated, which would be the babies that were apneic or had low breathing effort. We noticed that the occurrence of tactile stimulation in the control group was much higher than we uh, initially expected. So in this, in this trial, individual babies were randomized, which means that the same caregivers needed to stimulate a baby repetitively in the morning, while in the afternoon they were only supposed to stimulate in case of apnea. And this is the so-called Hawthorne effect. However, infants in the repetitive stimulation group had significantly better oxygenation, while needing a significantly lower concentration of oxygen. And therefore, the findings of this respiratory effort, although not significant, could have, have positively, possibly led to a better um, effectiveness of the non-invasive uh, ventilation. So they probably, uh, repetitive stimulation has probably facilitated respiratory transition of these preterm infants. On the other hand, is there any evidence of negative effects of tactile stimulation? Because one could argue, argue that it might distract clinicians to perform their main task, which is adequate mask ventilation, or that it could induce infant movement and thereby lead to mask leak. Well, the group of Vincent Gardner has performed a study in infants that needed positive pressure ventilation at birth, so the infants that were apneic or had low breathing effort. 
and they showed that infants that almost all infants received tactile stimulation just before PPV started. So the infant was apneic and then they started stimulation. But once ventilation was started, tactile stimulation was stopped because only half of these infants were still receiving tactile stimulation. In this figure, you can see that positive pressure ventilation is provided with pressure at the top, flow in the middle and tidal volumes at the bottom. And at the dotted line, which you can see here, the provision of tactile stimulation is started. And as you can see, infants start to breathe spontaneously, which is indicated by the arrows and by an increasing tidal volume. And because um, the, you can see that there was an increase in tidal volume, the authors also could show that there were, were no differences regarding mask leak or mask obstruction. So, so far, no negative effects of the use of tactile stimulation have been published. And we are currently planning a large trial on the use of repetitive stimulation in preterm infants. And we will implement this technique gradually through Europe as standard of care and then evaluate how oxygenation of these infants before and after implementation of this method of stimulation evolved. The primary outcome of this trial is the oxygen saturation at five minutes after birth, since it has been shown that this outcome at five minutes of life um, is uh, associated with the development of intraventricular hemorrhage and mortality. Um, we aim to include all infants with a gestational age below 32 weeks. And the design of this study is a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial. And this means that at the start of the study, all centers are st stimulating selectively, which is probably their current practice and uh, means that you would only stimulate once the baby needs it. So if the baby is apneic or has a low breathing effort. And then um, at random intervals, the center switches its uh, technique of stimulation to be repetitive, which are 10 seconds of, of stimulation alternated with 10 second pauses. And by this design, having first one phase and then another phase and randomizing individual babies, we try to prevent the whole turn effect um, by putting not too much attention on the intervention at the beginning of the trial. And then just before the center switch, we will implement a training bundle to increase awareness and to improve the stimulation practice. This is a very pragmatic trial to make sure that uh, as many centers can join as, as would like to, because part of the aim of the trial is to set up a network in which we can evaluate interventions that we use in the delivery room throughout Europe. Um, and this is the first trial in that network. So to make it very pragmatic for centers to join this network, uh, we are aiming not to record uh, many uh, outcomes. So this is the entire list which is recorded in the delivery room. And these are probably outcomes that you are already recording in the patient record. And for these, the only equipment that you need is a pulse oximeter. And then after one week after birth, we would like to know whether the infant was ventilated, received surfactant, if there were any abnormalities on the first ultrasound and if the infant died. And that's it. So it's probably not a lot of work because all these outcomes are usually recorded. So far, we have interest in participation in the trial from 36 centers in 19 countries, but we are still recruiting. We are looking for a total of 40 centers and over 3000 babies. So if you're interested in the trial, feel free to contact me or my or uh, call. Um, our contact details are on the next slide. There is still enough time to um, to discuss the trial with you and we can probably give a short presentation to your team or to uh, to discuss it. Here you can see the contact details of Colm and myself. Um, I would like to thank you to listen to this talk and I hope I could give you some ideas about why tactile simulation is an essential intervention to use in the delivery room. Thanks again. Okay, I hope that I'm not muted. 
So thank you for that, um, Dr. Decker. Um, very interesting, and yeah, we're looking forward to to hear what the audience will will ask after this. So um, the next presenter is uh, Miss Sophie Kramer, and uh, Sophie works as medical engineer and researcher at the neonatal intensive care unit of the Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. She studied biomedical engineering at the Technical University of Delft and obtained an additional postmaster in qualified medical engineering um, at the Technical University of Eindhoven. During her postmasters, she designed the Breathe the Body, a device that provides automated tactile stimulation to preterm infant in response to cardiorespiratory events. Both in her work as medical engineer, as in her PhD research, she focuses on how technology can aid the caregivers and or enhance their performance uh, in the NICU. The title of Sophie Kramer's presentation is Automating Tactile Stimulation, Advantages and Challenges. So with that, We hand over to Sophie. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Maria, for the introduction and the invitation uh, to present today. Janneke just talked us through the importance of tactile stimulation and its effect on breathing at birth. And I will elaborate on that by discussing the possibility to automate this intervention. Uh, applying tactile stimulation to evoke spontaneous breathing in newborn infants has been common practice for centuries. Doctors, nurses and midwives understood the need for tactile stimulation long before the first resuscitation guidelines were developed. It is actually a very safe and simple technique and for newborn infants is predominantly, predominantly applied in two situations. Uh, one, as Janneke discussed, during the initiation of breathing at birth, but also two to reinitiate breathing during apnea, which happens a lot on uh, on the ward on a NICU. Although the intervention is very common, the recommendations and protocols are not very specific on how to perform uh, tactile simulation. Therefore, before going into the topic of automation, I would like to take a step back and start where with the following question: How is tactile stimulation currently applied? I will start answering that question for initiating breathing at birth, or actually Janneke already did. She showed this overview of studies performed in the delivery room, uh, which were all performed quite recently. And the overview shows that the methods and timing of tactile stimulation to initiate breathing at birth vary considerably between caregivers and centers, both on performance, location, but also timing uh, and frequency. Um, the stimulation applied to re-initiate breathing during apnea was not described anywhere in literature until, until recently. We decided to evaluate it by ourselves by means of a mannequin study at award, and 57 nurses participated showing their tactile stimulation methods on a mannequin in, uh, as you can show here, in, a, in an incubator, and uh, they showed it on both prone, lateral, and supine position. Uh, all the stimulations that were performed were recorded and uh, analyzed by us. From the videos, we identified 10 different stimulation techniques, uh, varying from pressing to shaking, massaging, stroking, rubbing, squeezing, tickling, vibrating, scratching, and tapping. And uh, we also looked at the locations. So these techniques were applied at 10 different stimulation locations, which were in order of frequency, the foot, the back, the belly, the head, the leg, the side, the hands, the buttocks, cheek, and the arm. Um, in addition, we also observed three tactile interventions that were involved in an additional component and were related to specific locations. Uh, supporting the neck or chin to open the airway, lifting the entire trunk, 
and turning the infant into a lateral or supine position. In total, we saw 57 different methods, uh, so a combination of a technique and a location. And in conclusion, the study also showed that in the NICU, nurses use a wide variability of stimulation techniques to uh, counteract apnea. Uh, the most used techniques were rubbing the feet, turning around to supine position, containing the head, open the airway by supporting the neck and rubbing the back of the infant. Uh, however, this study did not give us any information about the responsiveness or the timing of stimulation uh, on the NICU. So we set up another observational study, but this time with real patients. Um, we built an experimental setup uh, consisting of a light sensor, which was placed on our patient monitor, which uh, was able to detect clinical uh, yellow and red alarms. Uh, and it was coupled to a camera at the back of the incubator, which um, uh, recorded what happened in the uh, incubator following uh, the alarms. Uh, 19 infants with an average gestational age of 28 uh, weeks were filmed for three consecu consecutive days, uh, and that resulted in a lot of alarms. We analyzed over 1,800 cardiorespiratory alarms uh, with a median duration of 11 seconds. And uh, from those alarms or from the videos, we identified four types of active responses, uh, pausing the alarms, but without further intervention, uh, adjusting devices such as uh, the mask top of the CPAP circuit or the saturation probe, uh, adjusting devices and providing tactile stimulation and solely providing tactile stimulation. But as you can see from the wide, right, right part of the graph, in over 90% of the alarms, the caregiver did not actively respond. Looking in more detail, we saw an association between the event duration and the response rate. So the longer an event lasted, the more likely it was that a caregiver would respond. However, even in the alarms lasting over 60 seconds, which are shown in the below bar, the lowest bar, still 40% of the alarms resolved without any intervention. Um, in case the caregiver responded, the average response time in our uh, ward was 25 uh, seconds. Tactile simulation, as you could see on the previous slide, was the most used intervention that we saw. Uh, but again, there were very large variabilities. This time we identified 35 different methods. Uh, again, 10 different stimulation locations, which you can see on the left, and eight different techniques, which you can see on the right. And again, three additional interventions that had a tactile component, which were the same as in the previous study, lifting the head, lifting the thorax and turn over the infant. Um, the thorax was the most uh, stimulated area, as you can see on the left part of the diagram. Uh, and in case stimulation was provided, the duration was on average 18 seconds, almost 19 seconds, and the completion time following the tactile stimulation, so the time the event lasted from the moment tactile stimulation was started, uh, was 30 seconds, uh, meaning that the alarm or the event lasted longer than the stimulation was provided. So in summary, what we have learned, to initiate breathing at birth, the provision and timing of stimulation is fully dependent on the attention of the caregiver. And on the NICU, to reinitiate breathing during apnea, the provision and timing of stimulation is fully depending on the assessment and response time of the caregiver. Both are thus dependent on human factors. And as we saw from the results, stimulation is highly variable and also often omitted. Uh, which bring, uh, brings us to our hypothesis and finally to the automation part, uh, because we hypothesize that automatic mechanical stimulation can enhance breathing, hence reduce hypoxia and bradycardia, because it enables a consistent and direct response. 
But the question is, how can we do that? So we came up with a program of requirements based on the studies and uh, we performed in a literature we reviewed. Um, and the device mainly has to meet three criteria. It should be effective, safe, but also feasible. Um, to be effective, we think the device should simulate human touch, uh, should be applied at a thorax, and to be safe, we don't want uh, the skin to burden because it's so vulnerable. And we also want to prevent habituation. And to do so, we think that it should be a moving stimulus and also the frequency and amplitude of the device should be controlled separately so you can make slight changes. Uh, also, uh, to be safe, we think no electrical components should be in touch with the infant and to make it feasible, it should be easy in use. So we came up with this device and called it BreedBody. In the gray box, there are two speakers placed, which once activated, create vibrations that are transferred via the silicon tubing to the silicon straps or to the balloons in the silicon straps, which are the blue circles. Um, the strap is placed on the upside part of the thorax of the infant and is fixated with the fabric belt you also see on the left. Uh, the stimulation is then applied by actuating the two little vibrating balloons just after each other, which will result in a stroking sensation going from the left balloon to the right. Um, we built this device to perform a fe feasibility and safety study, and uh, we created the full setup. So the device was again actuated by a light sensor placed on the patient monitor, which could discriminate between clinical and non-clinical alarms. So following a clinical alarms, uh, a computer would detect that and also would record what is happening in the incubator, uh, but also would send a signal to the speakers and the amplifier to start creating the vibrations, which will then be transferred to the breathe body and thus to the infant. The tactile stimulation provided in this study is completely different when we compare the manual sim stimulation with the breed body. Uh, because as we shown in the previous study, the occurrence, duration and uh, type of stimulation are completely on the discretion of the nurse and the timing is dependent on her reaction, her, his or her reaction time. While uh, with the breed body, the uh, stimulation will be provided following every clinical alarm and the device will immediately stimulate within one second. Uh, the stimulation will uh, continue as long as the alarm is active and it will always be this gentle moving vibration. Um, in this study, we showed that the design is uh, safe and feasible, but it's still in preparation, so I can't show any results further. Um, but we can conclude that it is possible to automate tactile stimulation in preterm infants. However, our hypothesis still needs to be validated. Um, and that leaves us with the following question. How can automatic tactile stimulation actually help um, most obvious, automatic tactile stimulation should be effective, and that's something we don't know. To date, it's unknown what the most optimal stimulation frequency or amplitude is, what the most optimal timing is, and where the trade-off lies between possible burden of, for example, overstimulation and the benefit of direct tactile intervention. However, we should also take into account that automatic tactile stimulation should not only be effective, but also useful. And assuming the stimulation is effective, how should the device be coupled to the monitoring? How is it easiest to apply on the infant, taking, to, take, taking into account that it should be uh, attached for extended periods of time and there are multiple procedures performed? And how do we provide feedback to the caregivers about this intervention while they are not doing it themselves anymore? So all in all, a lot of questions are still open, but we really believe that in the, with the right design, automatic tactile simulation will serve as a next iteration in improving respiratory management and can reduce human flaws and 
unwanted variability in human behavior. Uh, thanks for listening and I'm happy to answering any questions. Oh, yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you both for very interesting presentations. See if we have Maria with us as well. There she is. Seems so, like we missed the end of the presentation, but I don't think it was too much left, right? We're just caught up. Oh, okay. Oh. I, I didn't know. It was probably it. Yeah. Um, thank you both for very interesting presentations. Um, I have a few questions. So, just um, starting with Janik, I guess. Um, how widely accepted is the knowledge that you need presence of spontaneous breathing to for the non-invasive ventilation to be effective? Sorry, I couldn't hear the first part of your question. As a, how widely accepted is the knowledge that you need spontaneous breathing to be present in order for the non-invasive ventilation to be effective? Well, I think the, the animal data which I referred to in my slide was um, published in 2018. So this was the first um, evidence that, that came on the table that spontaneous breathing is essential in this process. And then um, over the last one and a half year, I think we have performed a clinical study in Leiden where we um, visualized the vocal cords using echo uh, echography uh, to see whether this also uh, the, this theory was applicable to human preterm infants too. And we noticed that the same we saw the same pattern. So again, if the baby was breathing spontaneously, the, the larynx was open, while during apnea um, the larynx was closed in, in most of the time. So these results have been presented at Jens last week and will be published soon, I hope. Um, it depends on how widely accepted you uh, you think it would be. People who are, who are in the field and who are very specialized in trying to stimulate breathing at birth or trying to optimize respiratory support um, will probably know the publications that have been there since 2018, but still the larger audience still will probably not be aware of this, uh, this important finding. Yeah, so hopefully when the clinical trial is published, we gain a bit more um, attention to this. Yeah, I'm sure. Oh, it's really, really interesting. Um, just from looking at your graph that you presented, is the effect of um, stimulation that momentaneous, that it happens directly when you start the stimulation, that you can see the volumes going up? Yeah, definitely. And you can also see it on the baby. As soon as you touch it, you, you see that the baby takes a breath or starts to cry, uh, but it also will diminish over time. So if you keep on performing it, uh, the, the baby gets habituated to the effect, so the effect diminishes over time. So therefore, we think that using a repetitive approach with pauses in between would be best to, uh, to stimulate. However, we haven't compared it to other ways of stimulation, for example, longer periods with shorter pauses or, or anything else. There's just not a lot of data on this yet. Um, because it's such a simple intervention, everybody figures that it's very important to use it um, without diving further into it. What aspects, what location of the body would be best, things like mm. that. Yeah, a lot more to explore then. It does the defect last even after a while after stopping the stimulation, or is it? Have you been able to see if it's? Well, um, I'm not sure about that um, because in the trial we did we stimulated for five minutes and looked at the effect in five minutes, and that's usually the part of transition where it's most useful because you can see that when an infant is born, the breathing will be uh, will not have a very high effort and that will increase in time. So when the baby gets older and oxygenation of the baby gets better, breathing effort also gets stronger or 
or better. So it's probably in the, in the first couple of minutes that it's really important to stimulate until the baby is well oxygenated and uh, is able to maintain breathing, have an adequate breathing pattern, stable breathing pattern themselves. So it's, it's, it's just like a startup to make sure that you can, it can make that increase fast and then thereafter the baby will hopefully continue to breathe on its own. Mm. Makes sense. Um, so Sophie, um, first I think maybe I just missed it, a clarification. So the, when you talk about the event duration or the time, the duration of an alarm, I guess, uh, is that the same? Is the duration the longer that the alarm lasts? Uh, in that study, I coupled uh, alarms that were very close to each other to one event. So if there were five seconds of a pause between two alarms, I combined it and called that one event. So sometimes it's one alarm if it's an isolated alarm, and sometimes it's a combination of se several alarms. Okay, and it's triggered on, on uh, breathing rate? Or there were all kinds of alarms, so it were all cardiorespiratory alarms, so uh, desaturation, low heart rate, bradycardia, apnea. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so, do you see if there is any, or were you able to tell if there's any method of stimulation that was superior to the others? There are quite a few to. <laughs> to look at yeah. and you could see which were the most common but were you able to see if those were also the most effective yeah of course we started initially started the study because we thought maybe we can find a method that the nurses the most of the nurses use and probably that w will be effective because they learn over time of course what works uh, but unfortunately we saw a lot of variation and with the data we have now it's really we cannot tell if one is more effective than the other. We once yeah. speculated about starting a trial where we uh, randomize infants to, if they get an apnea, stimulate only the foot or only the back, so we can uh, find out, but never uh, started that study. <laughs> and I guess it's also very so difficult to do that. Unclear, yeah. Hmm. I see. So how did you go about when you decided uh, in the design of the breathe body, uh, when you decided on the stroke over the thorax? Uh, because the thorax is most stimulated, so it is the most stimulated area. And also because it's a large area, there are no, not a lot of sensors attached to it or uh, IV, IV, uh, and also because uh, the lungs are in the thorax, so most breathings, uh, receptors, etc., are also in the thorax. So it's it's an it's an assumption, but a bit based on. Uh, but also, there's some evidence from the literature that if you stimulate a larger surface area, that you will also stimulate more proprioceptors. So that could be beneficial. But uh, I think it's an educated guess. Yeah. I mean, it seems like a, a very, uh, a very good start, at least. Um, so, what? Uh, I mean, can the breathe body? It's a very clever device, uh, and I'm very curious to see the results of the clinical trial that you are performing at the moment. Uh, do you have an idea of when you will be able to say more about the results from this one? I'm, I'm hoping to write it up in a month. <laughs> but we did a feasibility and safety study and we showed that it's feasible and safe to, to attach it to an infant. But we didn't really look yet at the effectivity compared to what the nurses do because we, we added it to the standard care. So we had a period of only manual stimulation and a period of manual stimulation and breathe body. So we didn't say to the nurses, don't stimulate if the breathe body is on, because we don't know yet if it works. So that will be a study we still have to plan. And that's so also we have research to do still. <laughs> and also, like it is in the delivery room, it's such a basic intervention that it's um, not a, people don't have 
equipoise to stop using it, even though we currently don't exactly know which method is best or how to perform it. You can't just tell people not to do it because everybody keeps on doing that since they started the job probably. So that makes it a bit hard to design a trial like that. Yeah. And still it made a lot of difference, of course, also if we added it on because it started immediately when an alarm started. So it stimulated on every alarm instead of only when the nurse reacts, which in another study we showed that it was only in 10% uh, of the cases. Mm. So they got a lot more stimulation in the one period compared to the other. I see. So can the breathe body be used in the delivery room as well? You think well, in the future? I hope we definitely can. I even think it might be easier because you can, uh, for example, already program a repetitive pattern. You don't have really have to respond to an apnea or to a desaturation. You can just immediately start when the infant is born. And I would assume that that would be less um, interference with giving manual ventilation than maybe someone being there stroking with a hand. Yes. And you're also not uh, dependent on if they think of it, because Yannick also showed in a study where you compared repetitive stimulation versus um, just do what you normally do. And then they also started stimulating more in the control group just because we focused on it. Um, so you also don't have the problem that if the focus isn't there, then there will still be stimulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, um, so for those preterms that are put in a plastic bag to, for thermoregulation, um, is there, what is the best way to do stimulation on those babies? Well, I think the way it is performed usually is, is dependent on the, the polyethylene bag that you are using. But for example, in our unit, we close the bag on the front and then we just apply the stimulation on top of the bag because it's so thin mm -hmm. that we still can think that you can perform tactile stimulation. And also you don't want to open up the bag to do stimulation directly on the skin because then you lose your effect of the bag. Mm. Oh, and I guess that's also a case where the breathe body potentially could be helpful, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But we also have to think if we, that's something I presented in the last slide, if the form of the device, so the, it's now a belt, but we can also think of integrating it in a mattress, for example, and that might maybe be easier to use during resuscitation. So we also might have to adapt the design a bit for the purpose where we're using it for. But there, there are all open questions still. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, it, yeah, very interesting, as you say. Um, have you um, have you found any other ways of triggering or encouraging spontaneous breathing than the stimulation? I also missed I part of the question. Sorry. <laughs> Have you, have you found other ways of um, triggering spontaneous breathing than uh, just tactile stimulation? Other ways? In your research, yes. Um, yes, there are other ways. And we know that the most imp important determinant for breathing is oxygenation. So um, if the oxygenation level of the baby comes across a certain level, which we do not currently know yet what level that is, um, breathing becomes more stable and babies have more effort. So um, oxygenation of the baby should also be a priority. But we have many priorities in the delivery room uh, and it's very difficult to do everything at the same time. And there are also automation could be helpful to make sure that you can focus on one job instead of doing 10 at the same time. You could also think about medication to use to, to stimulate breathing, such as caffeine, which we use in the NICU uh, day, on a daily basis. Um, we can provide that in the delivery room. And uh, from a small trial we did here in Leiden, we know that that stimulates breathing too. 
but again, that's another intervention that you should perform while you're there at the table. So it depends on how many people there are uh, present in the delivery room and, and what is your priority. But I think yeah. optimizing oxy oxygenation should be a priority. Mm. But I suppose with, uh, with the tactile stimulation, it's also so attractive because it is so easy to be done and it has been done forever, as you say. So it's, it's really no reason not to do it. Yeah. As well. um, I don't know. Maria, do you have any, do you have any questions? No, I think you have asked all of them. Maybe um, how many patients were included, Sophie, in the safety study? And has it been used outside of, of uh, Leiden? Uh, on the top of my head, I thought we included 16 patients. First, the first eight were in a bit uh, higher gestational age. So 26 to 30 weeks and then eight in the lower gestational age so 24 weeks to 27 weeks uh, and uh, it is a clinical prototype so we aren't allowed to use it outside our clinical trial yet because we first had to prove that it's safe so it hasn't been used outside the study and outside the LUMC yet. Well, we're very much looking forward to, yeah, <laughs> the results of it. Oh, well, we're really. <laughs> yeah. Exciting times ahead. Um, yeah. Let's see, do we have anything more in the Q&A? No, not there. And... Maria, do you have any? I can have a final question. Just taking one step back then, what's your, uh, what's the background or what, um, why did you decide on, on uh, deep diving into this specific area or topic? What led you into this research? Well, I think it was very interesting. Uh, my background is that I am a NICU nurse. So I have been working in the NICU far before I started my PhD. And I was also always very interested while being in the delivery room, standing next to the table and seeing all these very extremely preterm infants um, start to struggle to, to get to life to see um, why some babies do and some babies don't breathe and um, what, what, well, why we need to intubate some babies and we don't have to do that in other babies. I still don't have a, a correct answer, answer in that, but I think we've improved our practice over the last couple of years, trying to increase the number of babies that can be supported non-invasively in the delivery room, which can affect clinical outcomes. So. Um, I'm really happy to dive into that subject for a couple more years to see if we can get any further. It's a very important topic. So we're glad that you do. Indeed. Um, I don't have any further questions. I'll hand over to you, Maria. Okay. Well, it's uh, 16.55, so five minutes left. Um, but we don't have any more questions there and um, yeah we don't have any other questions either so um, we would like to say thank you very much Janneke and Sophie for joining us today and also thank you to the audience this uh, recording will be available um, within 48 hours and uh, distributed to all of those who have registered and we will also make it available um, on our website and uh, post um, in social media. Um, we might take the opportunity to say that we will have another uh, webinar in October, end of October. So um, stay tuned. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.
appreciate your uh, effort and, and participation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both. See you. Bye. See you. Bye. Bye.